<laughs> Hi all, thank you very much for joining us today to welcome Professor Santiago Legarre from Argentina. Uh, he is a professor of the Universidad Católica Argentina and he's a visiting professor at uh, Strathmore Law School in Kenya and Notre Dame Law School. He was also here a visiting professor in, at Columbia in 1999. And uh, I want to thank also Columbia Society of International Law, the American Constitution Society, and the Columbia Journal of Transnational Justice for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Thank you, all of you, for coming here today and queuing for such a nice food. I will envy you, <laughs> especially as we seem to have been successful enough that I won't get any food afterwards unless there is some charitable soul. So, I'm very happy to be here again after 21 years and very old, as you can imagine. Um, his father, Francisco's father, taught me when I was in second year of undergraduate. Now you can also figure maybe something in terms of age or maybe not. And uh, as you know, I'm going to talk, and I'm going to talk briefly about international law and comparative constitutionalism. And I will start by trying to define these two. To define the first of these two, I will need to offer uh, what Professor Henking here 21 years ago used to call a working definition of law, because, you know, international law is law. So for those purposes, I will divide the board in two, and I will consider that we are in the United States of America, as indeed we probably are, and on this side of the board, I will place law. That is, as I will describe it in this tentative working definition, a phenomenon where authority features prominently. And on this side of the board, I will place uh, the sort of non-authoritative normativity which you also do get in the United States. Now, I will use the United States uh, as my example, but if I, what I say is true, it's true of any country. So then here, A also stands not only for authority, but also for legal and for legal authority. Because there are, there are other uh, non-legal authorities like for some of us our parents for others our children for some their spouse you know they have some degree of authority non-legal so this is the domain of the law and of the laws and the domain of the legal but then we, in the first place, have in the United States, when I say in the first place, I don't mean in the first place, I only mean I am going to say it in the first place, domestic arrangements that go by the name of law. 
So we have statutes, customs, a constitution, state constitutions, court decisions. All of these are legal. They have, they purport to bind in a legal way by which is meant that they are a type of social construct that is intended to solve some problem of coordination in the United States or in South Bend, if this is a local ordinance, or in Illinois, if this is a statute enacted by the legislature of, of Illinois, and so on and so forth. They have a point, a purpose, a common good that they try to pursue, and they, these arrangements, as every other legal one on your left side of the board, have sanctions. That's a distinctive feature of your left side of the board, as opposed to the right side of the board, where, as we will see, there are no sanctions for trespass of whatever the non-legal authority enacts. Of course, you could say there are sanctions in a household. And a wife may punish a husband and the other way around. All of this is true, but by sanction, when I mean sanction in the legal sense of the term, I mean uh, the deprivation of your freedom, physical or otherwise, in a way that in our time and culture is only reserved in a sort of monopolical way to the government of the state. Then, secondly, but again, this is not Secondly, in hierarchy, we have another type of law, the one that interests us more today, and that is international law, where we find that the United States has agreed with one nation in a bilateral relationship on some terms. This is called a treaty. By the way, the terms of whatever arrangement on the left side of the board are very important. This is what people study in law school, among other things. What exactly does domestic law say? What exactly does this treaty say? And of course, interpretation and so on come into play here. In international law, we not only have bilateral treaties we also have multilateral treaties, as you know. They also have terms, they have conditions. Then there are courts. There are international courts. They uh, enact, or rather they hand down judgments and there are procedures to enforce those judgments, sanctions of different types, hence law. And then there is custom. Now, there is custom here as well, especially so in a common law country, but also in African customary law. There is custom that features on the left side of the board, and it's unquestionably law, and there are sanctions for the breach of custom. But perhaps where this happens the most, yes, that's my friend, the baby. Called Osvaldo, but people call him Ozzy after Ozzy Osbourne, which I can't, you know, celebrate excessively. Although I like his music, but I fear for the child's destiny. <laughs> well, he he may become a TV star, of course. So custom, you know, these days when we we think we have progressed so much that custom has a very limited role in domestic law and. You can go to law school, in, especially in the European countries, and they will tell you, oh yeah, custom, the Romans, you know. 
But in international law, custom is still very important. Very important. So we, we include it there. Then thirdly, same side of the board, we have number three, or if you want, it could be a subdivision of number two. Both ways are fine, in my opinion. And that I would call regional law. So domestic law are arrangements to secure some domestic um, common good, the solving of some domestic problem of coordination. International law is there in all its forms to try to attend to a good that is wider and broader, transnational, international. I noticed that there is a a journal who is sponsoring this lecture for which I'm grateful. I'm very grateful to the American Constitution Society and to the International Law Society, which I should have said earlier, but also to the Columbia Journal of Transnational Law, I believe it is. Is there any of you in, the, in attendance who is with this particular journal? You? OK. So. Uh, <coughs> I suppose in the, in the scope of what you guys do in the journal, you may include, perhaps within the idea of the transnational or the international, the regional, where you have a regional court, for example, but only for example, of human rights, but it could be, you know, whatever, private law, as you know there are. So you, you could have one for the Americas, you could have one for, and you do, and one for Africa, and you do, for Europe, a couple. There are norms, regulations, they are the law. And the, the way, for example, the human rights, uh, regional treaties and bodies function, as you know, is that what is decided by the regional court, for example, in San Jose de Costa Rica for the Inter-American System of Human Rights, is binding according to the court, not only for the parties in a given case when the case is remanded to the domestic jurisdiction, but it also serves as a precedent for future cases in a way not completely dissimilar to what happens with precedent, vertical precedent of the US Supreme Court. It is different, but not completely different. The Supreme Court of my country, they don't even treat it as different. When there is a decision of the Costa Rica court on a relevant matter in a case between Peru, for example, and and someone in Peru, although that case doesn't involve Argentina at all, then Argentina in a future case when they will decide, they will treat that, say, Barrio Saltos decision in Peru as legally, legally authoritative in Argentina. Not, not morally authoritative. And there will be sanctions, and there, are, there have been sanctions put forward by the regional court for the event of departure from the rationale. There is a tension there, a back and forth. So this is a, a case, an instance of, of legal authority that we need to retain. Now on this side of the board, there are many instances of non authoritative guidance or normativity or standards or measures. I gave some examples, family, many others, but there are, there's one or two I, I'm interested now in. The first one, remember we're talking from the perspective of someone who is in the US, but the same would be true, except that you would have to flip it if you are living in Mexico. So the first one is foreign law. This is very important to understand the great drama and problem posed by comparative constitutional law. 
What is foreign law for the domestic judge? Well, in my country, to stress the notion, we say that foreign law is a fact. It's, not, it's like a stone. It's not normative, which is not true. What should be said is, it has a non-legal normativity. It tells you to do something, but you're not bound by it because you're not among those it can authoritatively address. Except in one case, which is when the domestic law remands to foreign law, which some students, I guess not many students, I think, study in law school in this extremely difficult course, for me by far the most difficult one, but for me it was mandatory, called conflicts of law. We also call it in my part of the world private international law to oppose it to number two here. Now in my part of the world, the rules called private international law, they are part of domestic law, of course. So foreign law is not authoritative legally for the US citizen, lawyer who needs to advise, judge. And so it's not authoritative comparative constitutionalism, in my opinion. So both Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer in their famous debate in American University, they would agree on this. They, they, Breyer, who is for, as I am, the idea that borrowing, foreign, foreign, non-authoritative materials in constitutional adjudication may be a good idea, sometimes, and with some restraints, as he says, and as I say, He's not saying that it controls or binds legally the U.S. Supreme Court. So when Scalia is rebutting this, this is a phantom because no, he is not. There are some people we'll see who do say that, but not Breyer, not the Supreme Court of the United States in the famous cases, cases on capital punishment you are familiar with, Atkins versus Virginia and Roper versus Simmons, 2000, maybe 2002, 2005, right? There, the majority is using foreign law, foreign materials, but never treating it as controlling. So the dissenters, Chief Justice Rehnquist, Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia, they're firing bullets to a place where there's nowhere, really. The really interesting discussion never really happens, which is, uh, okay, we all agree that this is non-binding legally, but why are we still going to do it? Is there a reason for us to do it? Which is what I'm working on now to try to offer another reason, I suppose, but I, I, won't, I don't think we'll have time for that today. Maybe I'll send the member of the transnational, the Journal of Transnational Law, the the final version of this paper, and you can, if you would like to read it there. For the time being, let me just tell you that two things can happen as I move towards the final part of my talk so that we have at least five minutes for questions as we have only 12 left. Two things can happen that can make this collapse, and they happen all the time, and I consider, consider them really bad. The first one is a downgrade of international law, where international law becomes aspirational law. In other words, not law, but a source of inspiration, advice. Now, of course, if that is international law, and unfortunately, that's what many and many in this country and many courts in this country hold that international law is, then it's not very different from comparative constitutionalism because you may borrow from 
from foreign law if you would like to or you may borrow from international law because it's not law really and you get you know in, in some court decisions which I quote in, in the draft uh, even Supreme Court decisions you get references to international law and a decision of the Supreme Court of South Africa which is foreign law as if these were similar, like saying, you know, neither one really binds us, but we like them. Yeah, what if you don't like them? You see, the left-hand side of the board is relevant when you don't like what there is in the content. That's all what law is about. But if you can dispose, then you, this is what Chief Justice Roberts said at, at some point, you just choose what you like from here, but now after this downgrade also from here and the rest, you know. So if you are someone who is campaigning for the overruling of Roe v. Wade, you know, you will just look at those parts of the world that are pro-life and if you want Casey to stay, you will just look at the flip of the coin. It's a, it's a, it's a game that a professor should be able to play in classroom, but and not so the courts with international law, which is binding. Of course, the degree of bindingness depends on the terms of each international law. Secondly, there can be an upgrade of comparative constitutionalism into comparative constitutional law which is a disaster, and it's happening all the time. Let me give you one example from my country. So my country, whether you like it or not, has a section two in our constitution right at the beginning that says that Argentina is a Catholic country. It doesn't say it like this, but that's the gist of it. It's very clear. The constitution was passed in 1853, and at that time this was more or less unquestionable, then there were several amendments, but never touched this, so there it is. But then, of course, now we have a very secular society that coexists with a religious society in the same country, like here, and so many other places. And there has been a movement of reform which didn't succeed. So an NGO sponsored with American money, the Ford Foundation, they sued uh, the Argentine government and they requested that there would be uh, no religious symbols in public buildings in Argentina, which has successfully been done in other parts of the world, except that in those other parts of the world, there isn't an article two of your constitution that says, now I quote it literally, that the Argentine government supports the Catholic religion. So how did they overcome this norm? They couldn't reform it. They didn't manage to get the votes to do that. So they went to the court and they said, there is a precedent of the United States Supreme Court, that is foreign law, now for the Argentine court, now we flip everything and we are in Argentina and not in the US so US law is foreign law but this group said there is a precedent a case called Lynch v Donnelly you may be familiar with it in which the court exploring the establishment clause would say look you can't display religious symbols in in courts and places like that unless they have an independent secular purpose. So now this NGO and the court who agreed with the reasoning said, well, there is Lynch v. Donnelly. This, this was an image of the Virgin Mary, this particular case, does not have an independent secular purpose, which I think is, of course, true. Therefore, under Lynch v. Donnelly, it has to go, and it went. Now, the problem with this is that Lynch v. Nodley, now, I hope it will be clear from here, 
should be almost, almost secondary for an Argentine court. It's not part of the law of the country. So, so what they're doing is more or less treating the US Supreme Court in my example, but this happens you know, in all sorts of directions, as if it were the head of some non-existent regional organization that you need to abide by uh, their decisions, dis di uh, disregarding or regardless, rather, of what your own constitution says about this. So the downgrading of international law, at the upgrading, but it's not really upgrading, in my opinion, it's like changing the nature completely of comparative constitutionalism as a methodology and then misusing it and abusing it for ideological reasons in order to treat as legal what is not legal, I think these are bad news. Thank you for your attention. I don't think we have much time, but I'm happy to take one or two questions if there are any. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wouldn't like to say that they are the same. Indeed, they are separate on the board. So foreign law is one thing, and comparative constitutionalism is a, a different thing. I agree with you. Um, what I, for the purposes of what I was saying, they are both non-authoritative from the legal point of view, and that's what matters for my purposes. Of course, comparative, I want to say comparative constitutionalism, so I would like to replace the terminology comparative law and comparative constitutional law because I think part of the problem of what's going on, it's the terminology that it's to blame. Of course, if they tell you, come, I'm going to teach you comparative law, you may think that's law. Or if they say, come, I'll teach you comparative constitutional law, you may think this is law. And whatever comparative constitutionalism is, it's not law. So the way I see it, and we could converse about this with your professor from Italy, who asked me kindly this question, is comparative constitutionalism as a very useful, very promising, methodology subject to it's not be treating as controlling as legal so it'll be as justice kennedy says in roper i really like the way he puts it instructive confirmatory it can be used by way of dictum but then the interesting thing that I won't be able to address today is why? Why is it enlightening, instructive? How is it different from quoting a law review article? But you know, I'll come next year and we'll talk about that. Maybe one more question, perhaps? Yes, please, maybe two, if we have the time. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm curious, um, in regards to the point you were making of the dangers of um, sort of downgrading international law to constitutional comparative, I'm wonder, uh, com uh, comparative constitutionalism, um, I'm wondering <laughs> how concerning there are, that is, because there are, are a plethora of tools outside of just like legal um, mechanisms, like sanctions, um, international condemnation. So I'm wondering, like, well, ask, ask President Trump. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm from Pakistan and I have a similar thing that I provide modern judgments tend to have persuasive value as a judge of a free thing. They don't have the same status as being authoritatively binding. Uh, now, is this free thing more of a civil law common law device that is pervasive? So that uh, what is the state of foreign judgments in Europe? 
which yeah no what I meant about uh, Africa I mentioned Africa in the context of custom uh, is Pakistan a common law country so the short answer to your question and then I uh, we do the let it go thing and you can go if you want to but I'll stay here if you want to talk uh, is that this phenomenon is like cross-cultural it's it happening in the civil law world and in the common law world more or less exactly the same way now with your with your question you you gave me a very helpful word here because this this describes well what it is to have non-authoritative normativity or guidance so when the father tries to persuade or when that foreign court tries to persuade the world that what they're doing is right and therefore you're here in the United States and you say I accept that invitation as persuasion because this is, as the justices say, in this case it's for Lawrence v. Texas, this confirms that we're not crazy, that what we're doing here uh, might be reasonable. I won't say that it will be as a result of the persuasion argument or as a result of the multiplication of your legal solution because we know that 150 countries can get it wrong about something and it has happened, you know, with some great uh, disasters cultural in the world. But it will be like a, an indication. So I think the idea of persuasion um, plays a, an important role in the same way it does in the distinction between vertical and horizontal stare decisis or precedent, where in the vertical one, this is really legal and the Court of Appeals cannot depart, may not, ought not, but at the horizontal, for example, when one circuit is looking to what another circuit does, or even the Supreme Court, especially in constitutional matters, is looking at its own past precedent, they will treat it more as a matter of, you know, the wise policy is to, so this, I think, has something in common with that. So with comparative constitutionalism, my opinion is the wise policy is keep the world. You know, don't be closed to what the international community is doing. The way it's been put in those cases I mentioned and also in another one called Graham, they all deal more or less with the same uh, topics. Thank you very much. I'll stay here for a few minutes in case you would like to talk. <laughs>